Yes, hello and welcome to the Jock and Journo podcast. September is here, so it's a finals version. I'm Jay Clark and I'm joined by the Collingwood champ coming up to his 29th final next week. What an extraordinary effort, Scotty Pendlebury. How are you, mate? Very well, mate. How are you going? You're the one that's limped in, sore, wounded, wounded animal today. What, what have you done? Feeling a bit so- yeah, sick and sorry for myself. A bit sore, actually. I feel I feel a bit sick in the stomach. Do you know why that is? Why? I've had leather poisoning. Uh, last week, I play- on Saturday, I played a footy game. A dad's footy game. This is your annual school one, isn't it? The annual school game. Uh, we play against dads from other primary schools. And um, it actually got a bit heated, to be honest. Like it got a bit fiery. Well, you have the boxing record. So, so was it you? Was, I didn't. I didn't start any of that sort of stuff. But it did get a bit spicy. Yeah, they were played with Damien Peveril, from F, uh, former yeah, Essendon yeah. midfielder, and um, Daniel Harris, former North Melbourne uh, gun. But uh, I made the mother of all clangers. What are you? The mother of all mistakes during the game. L- last minute, we're down by a goal. I popped out in the halfback flank, had a man free on the half forward flank, and put it out on the full. In front oh, of everyone. No. Walk of shame. Bronx cheers. I heard some bloke go, put that in the paper. <laughs> so I really copped it. Who do you play against? Is it two? St. St. Vinny's, yeah. So another another primary school. The dad's from, um, the kid's from another primary school. So oh, it's no. been going for 15 so years. So your reputation's down the drain. Really took a hit. Really well, took a best hit. Your best player last year, weren't you, in the game? Well, I got a few easy touches yeah, at yeah. half back. But it uh, would have been nice to show some composure with the footy. Pressure. Pressure Ooh, makes diamonds, late. doesn't it? It does. Hey, speaking of pressure making, diamonds, you're through. You take on Melbourne. Of course, uh, the Magpies it's Thursday night in the qualifying final. Brody Grundy looks like he might be watching that from the sidelines, which would be incredibly tough. But uh, you'd be happy, mate, that after a wobbly month, the Pies look like they got back on track against the Bombers. Yeah, I always laugh. I think Craig McRae's new ones, like form. What what is form? Mm-hmm. People are you out of form or you in form? He's like, what is form? You have doesn't believe in form. it. Doesn't believe in it. <laughs> um, I found it. Yeah, no, it was good. It was good to get back on track. Mm-hmm. Um, especially defensively, we were really solid when the game was up for grabs in that first quarter. Yep, kept them to three points. We've kicked, I think, eight goals three ourselves. Mm-hmm. Most of that was turnover game. So on the back of defense, being able, being able to go back and score. So yeah, felt like we got some parts right and felt like we're in a really good spot now to prep and get ready. But it's been nice. You know, we we played Friday night, obviously, and then have been given four days off. So it's been nice to sort of relax and mm-hmm. let go of footy for a few days mm. and heal the body and um, yeah, just enjoy some time out. I'll tell you what I did notice, Scotty, and uh, I know you're the AFL's top disposal winner and you touched the ball more times than any other player in the history of the game, but I reckon your contested marks deep forward to be under 10 for your whole career. You've, oh, had an ele- you've had an illustrious career, mate. But when it comes to contested marking over your head, I don't know that you've got you've had that many. So when I think they, it's just general marking. <laughs> <laughs> so when they set you to full forward, when you got set this uh, full forward, was um, Craig McRae just sort of trying a few things? Was he just experimenting? Yeah, you're up by got, ten goals. Yeah, well, I think we'll sort of the rotations. I not going deep forward, and I thought, well, I don't have the pace to get away from guys here. I don't have the jumping ability, so I've got to try and outsmart, get yes. out behind, get out the back, or mm. um, tick up lead when they turn their head. So. I felt like I got two good looks, yes. but then I, as I said, I didn't have the jump to mark it. I didn't have the pace to get back on the ground level ball. So yep. it's pretty funny. I, after I dropped that mark, I tried to jump. I said the ground shifted under my foot. That's why I didn't get off the ground. <laughs> Come to the bench and Jamie Elliott, who was the sub, mm. just started laughing at me. He's yeah. like, that was so bad. That is horrendous. He goes, you cannot mark. I just was like, oh, I felt like, probably felt like you when you butchered that kick on the weekend. Yes. I sort of just wanted to go off there and then it's yes. like, I was out by myself. <laughs> my, my leggy hit a great kick to me. And, mm. oh, and then I yeah, just butcher, absolutely butchered it. Ah, oh, you're only human, Scotty. It's all good. <laughs> hey, um, but so it was a nice win. Um, the big story, as I said, I thought was Jack Ginevan. Now, I mean, the, comp- the competition pressure for spots has been enormous, hasn't it? Like, you look at what changes you're going to make this the next week. It looks like a tough 22 to pick. But Jack Ginevan, after not being in the team early in the season, we know about sort of the video stuff and the, um, the toilet stuff. So it was, a, it was a challenging start to the year. Going to be hard to drop off that performance. What do you have? Three goals and 20 odd possessions. Yeah, three goal assists as well. Yeah, yeah. I thought he was, um, yeah, he was awesome. And um, yeah, as I said, Fly, Fly's spoken about this, but it's not, it's not like he's just come in and then he's hit form. He's, um, yeah, I feel like for probably 10 or 12 weeks, he was our and he's still training at a really high standard, but mm. through those, you know, when he was in the VFL, you, you got like two options. You can drop your bottom lip or you can get to work and do something about it. And, um, yeah, he just set in a plan of, he wanted to be, you know, every training session, he wanted to be our best trainer. So train the hardest in the match play, 
get everything right. Um, I Did know you say that? Yeah, oh, absolutely. I've, I spent a fair time playing on him um, in those match plays, you know, at half back and he's, four, and he's just buzzing around everywhere. And, you know, I'm 35, three days post game. I'm not really wanting to chase him too much. So I'm almost like slow down here. Mm. Um, but yeah, he just trained extremely hard. He treated it like a game every training session off the field, you know, working with a dietitian, how he can clean up diet and just be better. And he's just, I feel like the habits he's learned in the last probably 10 weeks, try, trying to get through this sort of bit of bump in the road. How do I get back in? What do I do? Mm. Um, he's just got to work on the process and it's not just, he won't see that he like, he's obviously seeing the benefits a little bit now, but this will set him up for the rest of, of his career, having these habits that he's learned by being, have, you know, being challenged, fighting through mm. training standards, how, how important they are, your diet, everything you're doing away from the place. This sets you up for a long career. So mm. I'm great. I'm like, he, he'd be so grateful. He's learned the lessons this year. It's not obviously been the, the whole season he's wanted, but he's in right time of the year. He's got a spot. Um, and yeah, he'll play a big part in our finals campaign. So last year, did he kick 40 goals or thereabouts? He was a very, second year player, yeah, 40 goals. Very, yeah, yeah. But it would have been a hit to the ego early this season when he's not getting picked because it, part of you be thinking, well, I'm good enough. I should be in the team. Did you have that chat to him when sort of all that was sort of happening? Um, oh, not really. Um, he was suspended obviously for the first few games of the right. season. Yep. Um, so then, you know, and then we've obviously as the game moves on really quickly. So we find mm -hmm. a side, we start the year really well. Found it hard to get a place in. And then as I said, like there, there's the challenge right there of how do I get back in? And yep. instead of getting caught up into the week to week of, oh, I'm not getting a game where I am. It's like he just put in uh, put in place a really good process of, all right, what's going to give me the best chance to succeed here? Mm. Let's get my training standards right. Let's get my diet right, gym work right, all that sort of stuff. And um, yeah, it was a slow burn, but he's, as I said, he's got there and he performed really well the last few weeks since he's been back in. How do you just last on this? How about... How do you think he's coped broadly with the public attention? Like he came in with the peroxide hair and then Kane Corn sort of had a go at him for, with the video stuff. And then he obviously had the club suspension. Um, how, how do you, you know, he's attracted a lot of attention for a young yeah, player. Absolutely. How, how has he coped with all that part of it, do you think? Oh, yeah. It'd be fascinating to get him in one time and have a chat about it probably end of season. And yep. um, yeah, so I've seen it so many times come through our football club because I said, he's a 20, well, what was he last year? 19 year old kid from Castlemaine yep. who absolutely lives and breathes football. Like he's a diehard. Is he? He's a footy nuffy. Like yeah. loves it. And probably his passion for the game's probably been challenged in the last few years mm. because it, at the start when it all comes, it's amazing. Mm. But then sort of as, as I'm older, you sort of know you're almost, they're not getting set up, but you know that they're going to come for you too. Mm. Once they pump you up all this way, if they've put in a few bad performances, they'll come for you. So yeah, um, yeah he's probably learned about how big Collingwood is and, how to manage that and, you know, what to do and what not to do. And, um, yeah, it's a hell of a challenge and there's only, yeah, you, you almost can say like, be careful of this, be careful of that. Mm -hmm. But until they actually go through it and it's very unique, like he's probably, you know, there was Daisy that come through with huge fanfare. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, Geordie to go, he's probably been another one. Guinea, Nick Dacos, like there's, you know, guys that come through and it just seems to explode on them and it's how they handle it. And it's challenging at times because I said, when it's good, it's really good, but mm -hmm. then, um, it's just not riding that roller coaster, which would be so hard. Everywhere he goes, there's mm -hmm. people know who he is. You know, yeah. he's a huge in this day and age, a social media presence. So, mm -hmm. um, it would be, yeah. And I feel like now he's in a really good space. He's probably learned to not ride that roller coaster as much and just worry about the process. Staying more level. Which yeah, absolutely. It should be hard when you're getting pumped up time and time after again, then you fall off that cliff. Yeah. Um, as you, as you just mentioned, that can be a hard fall. I would have thought at times, but he is playing good footy and he's going to be hard to drop. Do you think he keeps his spot? Um, yeah, well, we've got a few guys coming back in, but I feel like, yeah, he's, he's all you can do every week in, I suppose, in any size, you put your name up there and give yourself the best chance. And that's yep. what Guinea's done. He was exceptional the other night. He's a very smart player um, and gets the right spots for us when we need him to. He can finish his work, create for others. And that's probably the thing that I've loved most this season when he's come back is the ability to create for others. So not only is he kicking a goal here and there, but he's more than happy to set two or three up, which is amazing. Going to play Melbourne on a Thursday night, 90,000 expected um, to that. Going to be absolutely monstrous. Grundy potentially watching from the sidelines. They are very good opposition. It'll be your 29th final. You walk up that race, Scott. You still get the you still get oh, the yeah, emotional response, the butterflies. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, finals, there's nothing better. So, um, yeah, I can't wait to play in that that one. Um, as you said, like I know there'll be 90,000 there. and yep. Against Melbourne, who will probably the form side with Brisbane, of the competition at the moment. Yep. So their confidence is going to be high. Our confidence is high. And 
it's going to be a cracking game. And that's what you want in finals. There's mm-hmm. no easy, you don't rock up in a final and go, oh, how good's this? We finish top. We just walk through to a prelim here. You've got mm-hmm. to earn everything in this. So yeah, we're looking forward to the challenge. So what's this week look like? Like I know you have got a few days off. Yeah. So we've got, we played Friday, um, four days off for us just to freshen up and get some energy in. And then where's, where in the country is Geordie? Do you know where he is? I think most of our guys, to be fair, went to Queensland to chase a bit of sun. sun. So I don't blame him. It's not been overly warm here. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, so we got that and then, yeah, we get back to training prep. So we'll train like normal once we've had these four days off. I think we've got a Sunday session with the Thursday night game and then mm-hmm. yeah, ready to go. So it's, it is really nice. I know there's always a debate about finals by like it or not from a player's point of view, just to, you know, get those extra days to freshen up mm. and then get ready to go and know you're hitting it at a hundred percent or as close to as, as you can be. So you're a fan of the finals, pre-finals bias? Yes. Yep. Yes. It Are helps. you? I like it. I think the final standard has been really good. It's yeah. not so much a war of attrition. I think the better players have been fresher. I yeah. think it gives them that break. Um, the players sort of pop a little bit more. I've noticed after the pre-finals buy, yes, it probably doesn't give the top four as big of an advantage as they've had previously, but then it, you know, but has anyone won it outside since the buyers come in the top four? Well, I think maybe the Bulldogs. Bulldogs that's 16. it. So yeah. like what? The 16 in. Say it's been here for 10 years, yep. like one out of 10 years, it's 10% chance to win out of top four. So yep. Yep. yeah, I still think like the top four, you want to finish as high as you can. And um, yeah, I like the pre-finals. Well, the interesting one's always going to be if someone does get a concussion in the prelim mm-hmm. and you miss that. It's like, should you roll in and then have a week off for the grand final to let that build over two weeks? So um, I'm unsure of how it works, but yep. yeah, you'd hate to see someone miss a you GF would. for for a concussion. But that does happen. But that's yeah, the, that's that's footy, isn't it? That's the high stakes and the drama around the preliminary final because there is so much on the line, player for the team, etc. Probably the best weekend of the year. Um, I would have thought, how's Nick Dacos tracking? He's not going to play first final, is he? It's more mm. potentially second final or prelim. Yeah, I think so. I think more of that second final or prelim depends, yep. obviously, what happens in that first final. But yeah, he's yep. tracking. I spent um, a bit of time with him yesterday at the VFL. We went to watch that game and yeah, he's really yep. confident that he'll be back and pl- play a part at some stage and um, yeah, he's, I think he's, yeah, I think he's integrating into some training later in the week. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, yeah, he'll be ready when he's ready to go. The last thing you want to do with a, with a type like Nick, who's in his second year, is it? Yeah. Yep. Second year is yep. roll him out there before he's ready. He's got a long yep. 20 year career. So, yep. um, I know you can get caught up real in the short term, but he'll be, he'll be right to go at some stage. going to be big if he walks out there or gets out there for preliminary final, um, and the attention he will get in that from the opposition will be interesting as well. Do you still tag him? I would have thought so. Um, the whole shape of the eight is really interesting for me, Scotty, in particular on the back of last year's exchange period. I mean, we spend so much of our time now, you know, covering footy, talking about trades and potential moves and the interest in that, you know, is, is enormous. And I look at some of those teams who have lost key players and, and improved. And I, I don't reckon we've sort of spoken about this a lot, but you guys lose Grundy, right? And win the minor premiership, right? Which was seen as a pretty bold move. And I know you brought in some players too. What about GWS on Sunday? So they lose Taranto and Hopper, like two genuine A-graders, midfield A-graders. And they come home, what, eight and two, make the finals, Richmond miss. And then you look at Hawthorne and they lose Tommy Mitchell, your man, and Jay Gromira. And I thought Hawthorne's midfield was one of the most improved elements of the season. Like they, you know, that some of the young guys, Connor Nash, et cetera, John Newcomb looks like an I grader, A grader. So it's like you lose these superstars in footy now. And I just don't know whether we've got our heads fully around it. And you, and these teams going forward, and this is really encapsulated for, you know, in this sort of final series. Yeah. I think, some, I think sometimes you probably don't see like the green shoots underneath that what's coming through. Mm. Like, so GWS, you don't want to lose these players, but they might know they've got Tom Green's going to get more opportunity. Mm-hmm. Cagnelio is going to get back. His body's good. He'll yep. be he'll be sweet in there. Josh Kelly now goes from a wing back inside. Yeah, things like that. So there's a lot of um, midfield depth at clubs that you don't know about. Even even for us at Collingwood, like Finn McRae has been sitting there, mm. dominating the VFL, mm. waiting. And it's you know he's just waiting for that opportunity. And there's probably guys at all these clubs that have just waited. Mm. Um, you know, with O'Meara and Mitchell moving out, that lets. Day, Connor Nash, John Newcomb all get yep. more exposed time in there. So, mm. yeah. So the midfield's the hardest position to break into in the AFL, but there's a lot of guys sitting there waiting in the wings. Mm. Um, you know, was like, I think Ablett, when did Ablett leave? Was it 2011 to go Gold Coast? Yes. And then they go on to win the flag. And he's yep. arguably the, well, Buddy Franklin left Hawthorne and they beat Sydney in the mm. grand final. They're probably the two best players of the last 20, yep. 25 years. They leave their clubs and their clubs go and win. So, mm. yeah, it's, 
it's, I feel like at the time when trades happen, it feels like they need to be analyzed who won or lost the yeah. next day. Yeah. Um, it needs to play out over a long period of time of mm. what you see, because, you know, Chris Judd left West Coast for Carlton and Carlton never played in a final series and West Coast then lose arguably their best player of the last 20 years. Won a flag. Won a flag and go play in the mm. 2010 final series, 2011, 2012 final series without him. Mm. So yeah, I think, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a funny, it's a build over time and you need to see what's underneath and, um, the clubs aren't dumb. Like there's, mm. you never want to lose players, but you never, you got a list of 45. There's guys coming through. So they just need a lot of it's timing opportunity and, and how you get it. I check myself now and I'm thinking, do we over, do I overestimate the impact of one player, one star player can have, you know, when you're not considering the salary cap room, you can make to bring in other players or, you know, better value, better depth. Look at the Western Bulldogs, right? So they played the 2021 grand final. <clears throat> Trelaw's there at one point since then. Snuck in last year, didn't win a final. This year didn't make the finals. And they brought in Rory Lobb, brought in Adam Trelaw. You know, you guys lost Trelaw, lost Stevenson, and have surged up since. So oh, I, I just think that's a really fascinating time for that this sort of, you know, player exchange uh, period. Like, I... I know we've touched on this already, but what must Brody Grundy be thinking if he doesn't, if he is on the sidelines next week watching both of those te- teams go at it? He's essentially been kicked out by, by two teams, in a sense. Like, that would be hard. That, oh, no that doubt. Be It'd be hard. Hard, hard sitting there watching. But, um, yeah, it's like the, it's a, it's a debate about, like, the number one pick as well. Mm. Like, every year, the number one pick, it's, like, extraordinary. It's like there's only him in the draft, and he yep. puts on this pedestal. And then number two is almost, like, pick 70. Yes. Yeah. Like he comes in, it's like yep. it, you're splitting hairs between pick one and pick two. Yeah. And then, yeah. So it's like, because I heard the debate about how oh, did North, they Tank. won, but they lost. Should they have tanked? It's like, why? Like when you just won a game of football, like and that club struggled to win a game of football for 20 weeks. That yeah. means more to the culture, the fabric of what you're trying to do. And people say, oh yeah, but who cares? It means nothing. You only won three games for the year. Well, you, you're in it to win it. You've got to learn how to win first and pick one is not going to come in and just change your fortune. And that's, unfortunately, <clears throat> pick ones get lumped with that. Mm. You're a pick one. You need to come in and you need to change the whole football club as an 18 year old. Mm. I'd rather go pick two. Mm. I'd, if You see it as a burden. It's a massive burden. They mm. come in, they're supposed to, oh, he's going to fix the midfield. He's going to be the star player. He's got the keys to the, um, to the bus, all this sort of stuff. Yep. Pick two comes in. It's like, you just need to do your role, build. Yep. Um, we'll give you more time. Yep. And it's just, it's crazy. Like the pressure Horn Francis was under at yep. North. Um, North. Yep. So he's got to drive the standards. You hear all this talk. It's like, he needs leadership around him mm-hmm. to harness him. And in four or five years, he could be the best player in the comp, but yep. he can't come in and have the keys straight away. He's got to learn the right way. And he didn't look like he coped with it, to be honest. And you can understand why. Yeah. yeah. Well, you have a look at, um. so like even for us, like Nick went pick three, did he? Four, I think. He, he was, and I know he's got the famous surname and that with us, but he wasn't under as much pressure as Horn Francis purely mm. because he went three. Yeah. If he had gone one, I reckon the pressure's elevated. Like Jack Watts is probably the yep. one for me that he was pick one. I don't even know who pick two was in that draft. Yeah. Like Jamara Yule Hagen was another. Yeah. Like there's a, so much pressure on these guys at pick one. I would mm. rather have pick two, pick three, pick four, pick five than pick one. Yeah. Yeah. Pick five's turned out to be a pretty good pick over time no. too, wasn't it? <laughs> oh, it's Buddy it's Franklin went pick five. <laughs> There's the bloke taking a pick five. Um, so you get no doubt. So watching North Melbourne from afar, and we've been talking about because Harley Reid, obviously, we've been pumped. We've been, I've been writing stories about this bloke for nearly twelve months now. Yeah, wrote about a, wrote a story about Harley Reid going back to February, trained with the Bombers for a week, and played in one of their um, scratch matches. Um, yeah. Right, and he turned he turned on a blind in this last quarter. He set sat Zach Merritt on his backside with the fend off with a don't argue. Right, yep. and I thought, whoa, this kid's seventeen. And he's, um, he looks like Dustin Martin out there, right? So he's been the number one pick the whole way and he's going to walk into that. But, um, you know, and, and it seems like he's going to be an incredible player, but you watching from afar, you saw what played out between North Melbourne and Gold Coast and you think, right, that's going to mean more for their culture, almost more worried for what it says about Gold Coast potentially. Yeah. Well, I I just don't think pick one Mm. is all it's hyped up to be when you've got, it's it's a different story. Say if they North win that game, they get picked 20. Mm Mm-hmm. Versus they lose, they get pick one. Yep. Well, then you're saying, well, probably we need to lose this game. Yep. Um, but when it's pick one versus pick two, it doesn't matter. Yeah. More importantly, they played, they kicked 20 goals. Yep. Like they looked really good. Like they'll get a bit of confidence off that. Yeah. And it's like, oh, it doesn't matter. It was a dead rubber. It's like, you're still going to get confidence from that game of, all right, we performed. Gold Coast played really well the week before against Melbourne. Gold Coast started the game really well. Mm. 
um, you can use that mm. as a little bit of fuel. All right, this is how it feels, boys, when you win. This is like we enjoy this. You're going to enjoy the next couple of days now, like whatever it is, instead of being, because the easy thing for North would have been roll up, get done by 70, because that's what they're supposed to do and then lose. And then you get pick one. And then mm. once if you don't improve next year, when you got pick one again, mm. it's like, it's all this pressure. It's like, I was really happy to see them win and play a really good and exciting style of footy. Did that, in your first year, we guys were, did you make finals in your first year? Yep. Yep. Really? So you walked into a club. Yeah. So we finished before. second last yep. before I got there. And that yep. was when there was priority picks. That's how old I am. Daisy yep. was pick two. Yep. And then I was pick five. You both played at Gippsland Power. Yep. yep. And then, so it was us, Carlton and Hawthorne, the yep. three clubs that had priority picks. So yep. Carlton had pick one. Collingwood two and then Hawthorne three and then four, five and six was yep. the same order again. So yep. Yep. yeah, we walked in and we weren't very good the year before we were second last and then we played, yeah, I've played, I've only missed finals three times in 18 years. So, um, I was extremely lucky. But I said like we, even back then, like Daisy walked in pick two and it was like, wow, we have pick two and there's a lot of pressure on him. Mm. But the rest of us, we just got to just ride on his coattails for a few years. Like he copped all the heat, all the pressure. And we didn't have to do anything like, cause well, he come in, he set the competition a lot in his first year, like yes. big hanger and mm -hmm. blonde hair and, mm -hmm. um, you know, had some really like amazing traits for a young 18 year old kid. But the rest of us, we just got to sort of cruise under his, we could play, you didn't have to touch it and you'd be all right because he had the spotlight. Yeah, he had all the spotlights. He so was, was, he was one of the, one of the few players and maybe Cosy Pickett fits in this basket as well. The great Dale Thomas, uh, who's an absolute legend of a man. Um, he could kick mark of the year and goal of the year. In the same passage. Yeah. And he had, and he's got the gift of the gab. So I remember like before his first game, they asked him, he's, you know, me and Ben Hart have played 300 games combined tonight because <laughs> Ben Hart had played 299 and Daisy's playing his first game. So yes. he had a bit of cheek about him and yes. he took a massive hang of that game and, um, you know, he used to chuck, chuck the ball under his arm and take off and run. And mm -hmm. this is before his ankle went mm -hmm. cuckoo and, um, yeah. but yeah, so he had some awesome traits. I, as you said, I played Gippy with Daisy. So yep. kicked four goals and had 20 in the grand final Daisy and like those four goals were four amazing, unbelievable goals. So yep. yeah, it was, um, yeah, I don't know why we've gone on Daisy Thomas around here, but he was a hell of a player. <laughs> you two were the yin and the yang. Why do you think Mick Mick bonded so close to him? I mean, they had a special, they had a special relationship back in the day. Did you, was that as obvious straight away? Um, oh, Mick was awesome with, I think Daisy's Everyone? relationship got highlighted with Mick, but he yep. was awesome with all us young guys. And, yep. um, I, or even before the final series one year, I remember him grabbing us all and being like, we're going to go as far as you guys take us. You guys are the youth use of the energy whip, so to speak. And I want you to bring all your strengths. Don't feel afraid of the stage. I'll back you in. Like he was just pretty empowering. Yeah. And because we were a young crop, they, as I said, just before we got there, they were second last. Mick probably could see that he needed to bring these young guys through. And, mm. um, yeah, I think in 2006, we played in a prelim final for Williamstown um, when we were, that was the Collingwood second side. Yeah. There was nine of us that played in the 2006 mm. that then went and played 2010 together in a flag. So um, yeah, the bond that that younger group and fostered by Mick and development coaches was awesome. Part of me with Essendon, you know, um, they started the season really well. So what they went further for their last five and then you completely popped the balloon out the weekend. They got smashed in the last two. I mean, there's watching it, mate. In that, what'd you kick? 10 of the first 11 goals or something like that. It's hard not to focus on the opposition and their body language for me. Like I, I, you sort of say, who's got their heads down? Where's the leadership in that moment? They just want the, the ground to swallow up and they die. Do you feel that out there? Like when you've got a team on the ropes like that and they genuinely doesn't look like they want to beat the MCG, like it's a packed crowd. All their fans came to see Waller and then they come up and it looked, felt like they just turned up their toes. Yeah. Like what is it like when you're playing against that at times? Um, oh, for us, we, yeah, it was more about us obviously on the weekend and mm -hmm. getting what we wanted to. And we were really happy with how we performed, especially that first quarter defensively. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then it just turns into a game of momentum of like, you know, we're all, you know, supporting each other, getting around each other, trying to drum up like that passion and yeah. let's, you know, foot on throat here, let's keep going. And yeah. you're almost trying to do that to psych them out a bit as well. Like yeah. you can see, as you said, you can see body language out there and yeah, like you're I'm almost over celebrating and really trying oh, yeah. to, yeah, we're trying to, on. <laughs> well, you're trying to deflate them as much as you can yeah. because while well, it's not going well for them, you know, at yeah. some stage they're going to have a little patch where they get a little run on it's mm. four quarters. You're not, you know, it's, it's the theory of, oh, we you didn't yeah. play our way all day. It's like, well, you're not going to play your way all day, but, yeah. um, and they had a little patch in the second where they got sort of going and they controlled the footy and missed some easy shots at goal, but you want to yeah. be ruthless. Yeah. I felt like it, we put the gap in the game when the game was there to be won yeah. at the start. 
Yeah, and you're just trying to capitalise on that. Sort of like when I play Yino against my four-year-old. You, know, you really got to draw two, draw six, draw ten. You really got to pull on the pain. They learn some lessons in these moments, I think. But they did look, um, and that's the thing. So you look, I look at Essendon and I go, right, where's the leadership? I think Zach Merritt's had a very good year, but that breadth and depth of leadership probably isn't there for the Bombers. And then, so Brad Scott says in his press conference, you know, afterwards that, right, extreme measures now time for us. And, you know, you sort of make a few calls, you, you sort of think about what that means. And I sort of think that the professionalism and standards desire at Essendon, I don't really feel like that has been there for a while. I think they had that one year, Joe Watson was captain under James Hurd. You know, I think they, um, you know, they, there was an edge about them there, Brendan Goddard, maybe at the time, but I think, yeah, they got some good young <laughs> players. Like they got five, they had five top 10 picks. Was it you know, Francis and Darcy Parrish? And then Reed, Nick Cox, Cox and Perkins. Like Cox yeah. looks like a really talented player yeah. on the outside. Does he really want it? Right. Perkins well, he's had are, some body issues, Nick Cox, has. hasn't he? Like his, own, his first yeah. year was awesome. Yep. And what is this now? His third, third yes. year? Yep. He's had some body trouble. So I think he needs a bit of, yep. a bit of a pass. Yep. I know he was out there on the weekend, but he's an elite runner. Yep. That first year he was awesome, but he's yep. had some issues. Like, but he's six foot five. Yeah, probably 85 kilos. Like he yep. needs to put on some size. Yep. And that's where, and I heard Scotty say it, that's where your off season as a player is, it's more important than your preseason. Because if you come in shape, ready to go day one of preseason, the preseason, you will get through it. Well, what are the standards then that you put on your teammates then? What what are you expecting from your teammates? Like we know you would probably, so you yeah. would give yourself how one well, week yeah. off? Yeah, what? Well, yeah, I sort of take... Yeah, anywhere seven to 10 days off mm -hmm. just to decompress and relax. No and then, exercise. Yeah. And then I'll start just slowly getting back into it. So like after 10 days, I'm not back doing, you know, full on running sessions, but I'm just starting to tick the legs over because mm -hmm. I find it's easier to stay in shape than fall out of shape, mm -hmm. you know, take four weeks off, get on the cans, eat shit, whatever it is. And then, all right, click the fingers, all right, back into it again. Mm -hmm. So I just like to just keep ticking along and then eventually... You know, when time's right, you start ramping back up. Because I like to hit pre-season day one when I come back, knowing that I've done the work and almost I'm not going to find it a big adjustment to the training loads. I've done almost it. done a mini pre-season before the pre-season starts. And I've done that for 17 years or 18 years now. And I just find like I get through pre-season easier and easier every year. I remember I was speaking to you once, might have been about December 10, talking about something. So, what have you been doing today? And you sent me a screenshot of your... Um, GPS or whatever it oh, was, yeah. and he's yeah. done an hour 40 hill running session. And yeah, I, yeah. I think I was still dusty from the night before, but, um, <laughs> and that was in uh, early December or whatever it is. And I, and I just don't know that that exists at Essendon or that's what I'm, that's what I thought Brad Scott was talking about in saying we, the standards are, are going to go up a lot yeah. in terms of our off season, because he came in probably the back of that last year. Yeah. Well, you hear, so whenever you interview a player, and they start the season really well. You say, oh, you're amazing start the year. Why? Mm. And like, oh, I had a great preseason. Mm. Oh, okay. So how was you, why did you have a great preseason? I had a great off season. I went over to America or I just stayed in Melbourne or Queensland, wherever it was. And I trained really well. I put yep. myself in a really good spot to do it. The hardest thing is to do it year on year mm -hmm. because often players have one really good year and then they think, all right, this is like, I've got the formula. Yep. I had a really good season. I'm going to just have a really good season next year. Yep. I was like, well, how do you get better? You got to go back off season. You got to do probably a little bit more than you just did the mm -hmm. last off season. Yep. And that's where it's hard because every off season, you've got to do the work straight away again. It just starts and it just, mm -hmm. it gets so repetitive and it does get mundane and a bit boring at times. And, um, you know, early days for me, I could just do all that stuff by myself. It didn't bother me. I'd, you know, I'd go back to sail or wherever I was overseas, I just, I'd loved it. But okay. now as I've got older, mm -hmm. um, I more enjoy, you know, Friday afternoon, the boys that live around me, Hey, let's go have a run, a kick down in Hampton or Hyatt or whatever. And we'll go have that. Then we'll go have lunch afterwards, have a couple of beers or whatever it is. So make it a bit more social, but you're still doing all the work yeah. and then you're dragging others with you as well. Mm -hmm. So you know that everyone's mm. doing the work. And then <clears throat> the other good thing with that is if you start doing the work with guys, you know, six weeks out, News all running and you feel that you're behind or they're behind. You're like, Hey, you know, you jump. That's when you'd be like, Hey, make sure you come next week when we do all these, There's, you got a little bit of work to do to catch up here. Mm. Um, and that's when you, that's how you keep people accountable. So mm. yeah, I've got no doubt Scotty will drive that at Essendon. And yeah, I feel like players, it's, it's your responsibility. You're, you're a full-time yep. player and athlete. You're not a nine yep. months of the year person. And then when the season ends, it's who can put up the best social media pictures from around the world. It's <laughs> let's get, let's get into it, do the work, have fun. But yeah. You're talking like an hour or two a day yes. max. Like what, even if you, what, I don't know what else you're doing. Like yep. 
just get get it done. Yep. And then, like you, you're setting yourself up to succeed mm. by not doing it. You're setting yourself up to yep. be sitting in the stands. No one wants to be sitting in the stands watching footy. So do you get frustrated though um, when you get a young, talented player to come, who comes in and then isn't self motivated or isn't self driven? It doesn't like needs to be, you know. No, I never get annoyed with young guys because they they're like they've got to learn how oh. to do it. It's more if we had a young player come through and mm-hmm. they didn't get it, yeah. I would put that more on our senior group that we didn't educate, help him, yeah. get around him enough. And then you can educate them and they'll get better. Where it's if they keep doing it consistently, mm-hmm. then it's probably on the individual. But yep. like a young guy's always gonna ebb and flow. Mm-hmm. The really special ones don't. Like they just get it. They know what they want to do because they love it and they're mm-hmm. so hungry to succeed. But there's a lot of guys that they come in and they're footballers. Yep. They're not you know, they don't know how to program themselves. They don't know exactly how much running to do and all this sort of stuff. So that's where I reckon it's so important. You get in groups, you do your work. As I said, it's one or two hours a day. Mm-hmm. And then you can help these guys through. Yep. Um, but yeah, I feel like that's why seeing your leadership at your footy club in players is just so important. You need leaders to lead yep. these people. Yeah. Well, yep. I, I felt like that um, Jaden Stevenson fit into that category. Like watching training, we know how to tell. He kicked 40 goals in his first year as First year as well. Yeah. For, did we he play first year, 18? I think so. Yeah, he won um, the Rising he Star. He won the Rising Star. Yeah, yeah. And then, but then, and then he obviously moves on in North Melbourne. And I thought he had some okay you know, patches throughout this year, but he's probably one who jumped off the page at me who probably wasn't completely driven and dedicated. I did not see him work like yeah. I've seen probably a lot yeah, of Yeah, well, he was there. probably, you know, we talk about Collingwood people that come in and made like huge impact. Mm. Like his first year was mm. nuts. Like mm. what he did that year was crazy. And then, Along comes the fanfare, the attention, and then, yeah. And then the lesson for Jaden would have been the same thing. Yep. Off season, I played all games. I'll just roll out and do the same thing next year. Yep. I said, that's not on him. It's on us to yep. educate him better. And, um, I think I've heard him speak since like he's, you know, his, his weight training's better at North Melbourne. His mm. training standards have improved and he's realizing all these things need to go up, but it's very hard when you come in as an 18 year old yep. and you dominate AFL. Yep. Like you're not going to put a premium on all these little things until mm-hmm. they start getting challenged. Then you realize how important they are. Yes. And it takes, yeah, everyone's different. It takes people time to figure this stuff out. Has the penny dropped? Possibly it has. Hey, it's a uh, mad Monday, a wacky Wednesday, um, coming up this week. <clears throat> wacky I, Wednesday. Mad Monday's dead. I don't feel like you would have been great at wacky Wednesday, to be honest, being good at a lot no. of things. I reckon overhead marking and wacky Wednesday, <laughs> yeah. probably not, not two of your biggest. Yeah, yeah, this not is my strengths. I, I probably come in more into the I'm not, My first ever... Wacky Wednesday, I was petrified. I was like 18, yeah. rolling in. It's like no idea what to expect. And yeah. everyone's like, just do not be late. Yep. So like all us young guys are there. We went to a pub in Carlton mm. and I was like, oh, this looks like a nice pub. Mm. And we walk in and like, oh, you're in the back room. And I was like, oh, cool. They've got a private room for yeah. us. This is awesome. And yeah. we got locked into essentially like a concrete room. Yes. And they didn't let us out until like the time was up. So there was like beers and stuff in this concrete room. Right. And it's like it the was, whole group or just like, the young blokes? No, the whole group. Yeah. It was a concrete room. Like there was right. a few like park benches put in there. It's like, <laughs> like what do you do? Cell. Yeah. And if you wanted to go to the toilet, like you had to take like the senior guy had to let you out and then you had oh. to be back. And it was like, I was in a concrete room for like six hours. I was like, <laughs> I thought I was going to watch someone get murdered or something. Like, oh, and then that's why I've probably got bloody anxiety about it. It's mm. like seeing some stuff that. Yeah, it's just, I was like, what is, I was fearing for his safety as an 18 year old. Oh, well, he's sure Ben Johnson, Dane Swan, Dale Thomas kicking around. It's always the, it's not those guys you're worried about. Oh, who it's are you worried about? It's the quiet guys that you're worried about like, on um, just some of the guys who don't let their hair down often that right. can have a few beers and then yes. all of a sudden they're six foot eight and they're Tyson right. Fury of the boxing world. So you worry about those guys, right. but yeah, so yeah, you just didn't want to get on the wrong side of anyone. You just, yeah. It's like House of Cards. You're almost just playing everyone off until that door got unlocked and then you're out. Well, Safety. I reckon you have dropped, dropped more smoke bombs at Mad Wacky Wednesday oh, sessions. 100%. Um, than anyone. But it is going to be a tough time. Exit meetings also happening in, um, at the moment and players being told that they might be put up for trade or not having their uh, contract renewed. So it is a difficult time. Yeah, um, surgeries, all that. So usually what happens... It was like, bang, you're out. So say Western Bulldogs, for example, they've, their season's done. Mm. It's like today you've got your exit interviews, you've got your medicals. Then if you need anything done, you're getting an MRI. Yep. So everyone thinks it's like, oh, you're done. You're out on the beers for a few days. It's like, there'll be some guys that are like medical screening, exit interview, MRIs, yep. Yep. surgeon meetings. And then tomorrow they'll be in getting operations, mm. surgeries. Like 
Mm. It just happens so quickly. And then that's where once all that stuff's done, then usually there's like a wacky Wednesday or something yep. like that that happens. The cats will be on the news soon. I'm sure they'll have a big dress up as they usually do, but do it better than uh, anyone. Although since they didn't make the finals, I wonder whether they might um, tone it down. They're all, now, Tommy Dullard, our superstar producer, says, no, nah, they are out in force today. So that's good news. I like that. Hey, quickly on um, our All-Australian picks. Now, we disagreed. Um, in fact, you you thought my All-Australian team was horrific. Um, no, go, I didn't think it was horrific. But should we go said, through it quick? Well, I had yeah, Tommy yeah. Stewart in there. And yeah, you no. reckon Cal Wilkie should be in there? Yeah I, th- yeah. I think it's like sometimes, oh, it's, yeah, it's like, say, um, Dusty Martin for me. Yeah. Obvious choice. Has half forward flank. Yep. And I was like, oh, he hasn't had as good a year as... Yep. It's like, well, who are you comparing him to? What? Mm. If he gets compared to that year that he was just nuts good, yep. well, then he never makes another All-Australian side. True. Can't be a victim of your own standard. Yep. So, like, he's in. But I, I'll do my back six. I had Go. Wilkie, yep. Darcy Moore, Dan Houston, Nick Dacos, Harris Andrews, and Sinclair from St. Kilda. Yeah, I had Stewart in instead of... Um... Shield instead of Wilkie. Yeah. And then midfield sort of picks itself. Oh, you got Nick Dacos in the back flank? Yeah. Yeah, so do I. Then we got Josh on a wing. I got Butters, um, Senna or Bonten Pally, whichever yeah. way you want to do it. Goulden's the other winger. Yeah. Yeah. And then half forward, Rosie, Kerno, Pachaka. Is that the same as yours? No, I went Walker, Larky, Dusty. Yeah, okay. Yeah. But you'd have Pachaka in there somewhere. Yeah, I've got Pachaka in Toby there. Toby Green, Toby Walker, Charlie Cameron. Toby Green's the captain, is he? Yeah, I've got Toby Green as my skipper. What is he like playing against? Awesome. He's just, so. oh, just because he's, he's a great player and yeah. someone that you've got to remember that you're playing against and not watching. Yeah. So you can just do some special things and Is yeah. Is he chatty? No, nah, no. Nah. He's just, he's in, he plays on edge, but he plays at such an intensity and speed that he's just, you've got to be on all the time with him. Mm-hmm. You can't just switch off for a second. Otherwise it's a goal. Um, yeah. And I think what he's done with that group this year, um, you know, first year captain to still perform the way he does. And they all seem to rally around him really well. Um, but there's, you know, Toby Green, Darcy Moore. I have Jordan Dawson in my side. Bont and Pelly. There's a few actual captains in there that could do do the job. I've got Merritt, Zach Merritt ahead of Dawson. I've got Jordan Dawson. Yeah. I just think his ability, Dawson, front of center to generate scores is so good. And he got targeted a fair bit late in the year. Did. But then even like the ability, sometimes they'll go, Jordan Dawson, you're going to go play on Bont and Pelly. Yep. Like he's flexible. He's not just sort of the one go out and try and rack up as much as you can here. He's got, and he's just, his left peg is just beautiful. Sammy Taylor's in for me. Yeah. I, I'm Denard. I just think he missed, he really played like he missed seven games, didn't he? Yep. I think that's too many. I'd Libba. Caleb's wrong for me. Yeah. See, it's, there's so many good players. That's why I know yep. some people say don't do a squad, but I feel like it's yep. good recognition to still be in the squad. Sicily I had was my seventh defender. Yep. And I had Larky in. As my sort of like other, because most sides play with three forwards, but one of them's a resting ruck. Yep. So he could be the resting ruck for that side. So that works. Yeah. Interesting. Um, so you won five best and fairest six all Australians. Do you, what do you rate more highly? What do you mean? Best and fairest or all Australians? Um, oh, best and fairest. Yeah. Yeah. What yeah. about Steve Johnson said he rates the coaches award yeah. higher than the Brownlow. Yeah. You agree with that? Yeah, Absolutely. He said that Brownlow's lost its shtick. Oh, not, oh, yeah. I don't know if it's lost it. I think just the, um, the fact that like who votes on the coaches thing is the coaches. Yeah. They're the ones that are, you know, strategizing and planning for the game. So they have the best understanding of what influenced that game that week. Mm-hmm. So, and even like the all Australian, the selectors who sit on it, mm-hmm. they don't watch every game of footy. No. Tell me stats don't influence their. Of course it does. Whereas the best and fairest isn't influenced by stats and stuff like that. It's role compliance. Ability to impact, ability to help others. Um, so yeah, that's where it's, yeah, I think the, the, yeah, if you sort of rank the awards, like the coach's award is the one that has the highest weight. So has there been a standout player in the competition for you this year? Yeah. Nick. Dacos. Yeah. Cool. But he probably won't win the coach's award because Game he's point. missed the last four or five. But yeah, I think Nick's was, the, was the standout for a long portion of the year and then Butters, Rosie, Bontempelli, Petrarca, yep. Yep. all those guys. And those guys I just mentioned will be the midfield yep. of the All-Australian side. So yep. usually the All-Australian side, if you looked at probably Club Best and Ferris, yep. they're all one, two or three in that as well. We're going to go, but where do you keep all that? Where do you keep your six All-Australian trophies? No, you get a blazer. Uh, so where do you, just, where do you like, keep all that stuff? They just patch it. Yeah, like uh, a separate, mom's, you mom's a separate room. You know, she's yeah. got a shrine to you. Yeah, mum's got a shrine out the back. <laughs> yeah, it's, in, it's in dad's garage. It's just covered in dust and Is dirt. It? And he just says he... I reckon every time I get back, he covers it because it's probably all ruined. He just throws this black sheet over it. There's all the stuff still under there, Scott. 
So I don't, well, I don't really look at it anyway. So Right, September's here. Can't wait for a great time of year, Scotty. You're up and about. Are you on your toes? You're yeah, excited? it's amazing. Yeah, the weather turns a little bit. We go from eight degrees to nine degrees in Melbourne. It's lovely. So, mm. no, I can't wait. It's an exciting time of year Yep, because you know what you're playing for. A couple of days off, and then we're going to speak again. Collingwood versus Melbourne. What a qualifying final that will be. 90,000 in the house. Absolutely can't wait for it. We'll speak before then, mate. Thanks so much for listening. And uh, we'll catch you next week. Cheers. Thank you.